Hello and welcome to Class Wire, the show that helps you to understand, appreciate and enjoy all aspects of English language and literature. Today's episode is brought to you by Jack Hunt School, one of Peterborough City's leading 11 to 19 comprehensive schools. With specialist language college and sports specialist college status, Jack Hunt School offers a truly dynamic, vibrant and multicultural community for all your secondary educational needs. Today is Friday and you know what that means. Hello and welcome to Poetry Friday. In this session we're going to take a look at the poem Once Upon a Time by Gabriel Akara. Let's take a quick look at Akara's background. He's a Nigerian writer, born in 1921 and still alive today. He's very interested in capturing the culture, the values and the voice of Nigerian people. He's very interested in their kind of traditions. He's from the Ijo tribe. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and so as a Nigerian writer, he's very interested in how its culture um, survives, even though it's kind of meeting and clashing sometimes with Western culture, which is coming into Nigeria. Nigeria is a country in Africa, and you can see it indicated here by green on the map. One of the things that Akara is concerned about is that Nigerian people are losing their authentic Nigerian identity and their behaviours because of the influence of Western culture coming into the country. Now, part of this is because of the history of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria was colonised by Great Britain in 1885 and it became a British protectorate in 1901 and it stayed under forms of colonial control up until 1960 when the country gained its independence and now of course it's, it's controlled and governed by Nigerian people themselves. Saying that, it is still, even today, under forms of influence from the West because it's a trading partner. Uh, Nigeria exports a number of products and it's also a very small oil producer. So it has, still has those connections to the West. Um, and this is kind of one of the concerns that we find in the poem. Akara is worried that um, Western development in the country is changing the culture, the attitudes, the values and traditions of the Nigerian people. And he's worried that those changes may be irreversible and might be changing the fundamental nature of what it means to be Nigerian. Let's take a look at the poem itself. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes, but now they only laugh with their teeth while their ice-block cold eyes search behind my shadow. There was a time, indeed, they used to shake hands with their hearts, but that's gone, son. Now they shake hands without hearts, while their left hands search my empty pockets. Feel at home, come again, they say, and when I come again and feel at home once, twice, there will be no thrice, for then I find doors shut on me. So I've learned many things, son. I've learned to wear many faces, like dresses, home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile. And I've learned, too, to laugh with only my teeth and shake hands without my heart. I've also learned to say goodbye when I mean good riddance, to say glad to meet you without being glad, and to say it's been nice talking to you after being bored. But believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. I want to unlearn all these muting things. Most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh, for my laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth like a snake's bare fangs. So show me, son, how to laugh. Show me how I used to laugh and smile once upon a time when I was like you. Let's take a closer look at the poem in more detail. Well, the poem itself is written in second person and it's structured um, as a dramatic monologue. We hear a father talking to his son. So the reader is put in the position of the son who's listening to the father talk. We never actually hear the, the son respond in any way. So the reader of the poem takes on the position of the son who's listening. In that sense, it's very similar to the poem If by Rudyard Kipling. It has a very similar structure and the same positioning of the reader as the child listening to the father talk. The mood of the poem is very negative. It's got a very sombre, reflective tone, and it's full of bitterness of the father talking, bitterness towards the Europeans, bitterness towards Nigerians who've changed their behaviour, and kind of a bitterness at the culture of Nigeria having changed, and a general sense of regret at having trusted Europeans uh, in the first place. 
So the tone, unsurprisingly, in the poem takes a very cautionary, advisory tone. It's still caring for the son um, and concerned for him because the father doesn't want him to learn the same behaviour, the same westernised behaviour that he's learnt. And he's hoping that the son might be able to change things in the future. One of the themes that runs through the poem is advice and guidance. We have the father offering advice to his son um, because the father hopes that his son won't actually follow his example. Um, this is the main contrast with, in fact, with the poem If by Roger Kipling. In If, the father wants the son to follow his example and become like him. But in this poem, in Once Upon a Time, the speaker, the father, doesn't want the son to follow his example because he's kind of become more westernised. He's followed this kind of fake and sincere example and lost his authentic Nigerian identity. And he wants his son, if anything, to teach him how to regain that sense of an authentic self. So the advice and guidance is subtly different in this poem. We have the relationship between the father and the child. And of course, we have relationships more broadly speaking, because all the way through the poem, the father keeps referring to they. And it's not clear whether the pronoun they refers to Nigerian people who've changed as a result of contact with Western culture and behaviours and traditions, or whether the they uh, refers to the Europeans who've come into the country and started changing things um, for the worse. So we have that clash of cultures and values, the clash of the European um, mannerisms and behaviours coming into Nigeria and changing the way that the Nigerian people behave and act. The father feels a deep sense of regret and remorse about how he's changed his identity um, to accommodate those Western behaviours that he feels are insincere and fake. Um, and there's this whole issue, of course, running through the poem of trust, honesty and dependability, this idea of um, being an authentic person, being an honest person with integrity. Um, and the father's hoping that his son won't follow the bad example of himself um, by learning these bad European behaviours. And the father hopes that the son will be um, a more authentic Nigerian man and have that kind of integrity um, by following his own culture's um, values and traditions. And this question whether Nigerian tradition can survive contact with European values uh, kind of runs through this poem um, and, of course, through Akara's work more broadly. Now, as a result, the poem does have a quite um, negative tone to it. But there, at the end of the poem, there is this question of whether there is some hope for the future, whether the sun in the poem represents this possibility and chance of Nigerians regaining and reclaiming an authentic Nigerian identity. Let's take a look at stanza one in more detail. The title of the poem, and in fact its opening line, is a phrase taken from Western fairy tales and children's stories, this idea of once upon a time. Um, so it's quite ironic as an opening because the poem is all about Nigeria regaining its um, authentic, true Nigerian identity. And yet the poem itself opens with a phrase which is more traditionally associated with Western culture. So even in the opening line in the title of the poem, we see that tension between the different cultures. All the way through the poem, the speaker refers to this um, group of people with the pronoun they. It's not clear if the they refers to the Europeans who've come into the country and changed how Nigerians behave, or whether the they refers to the Nigerian people who have started to follow the more westernised behaviours. Either way, this use of the word they is very impersonal and it kind of carries that sense of alienation and bitterness of the speaker. Um, we sense that he feels very angry about what's happened. The poem also uses past tense to suggest this idea of looking back to the past nostalgically and hoping in some way to kind of return to it. In this case, the, the father seems to think that the past was better than the present. What it also points to is this idea that the behaviour of people now has changed, that the friendliness and warmth the father was used to in the past has ended and people's behaviour now is far more fake and insincere. We also see some interesting imagery in the poem. This idea that people laugh with their teeth is very hostile and aggressive. It's not sincere laughter, it's very fake, but it also kind of conjures up this imagery of how uh, monkeys show aggression by gritting their teeth and smiling. Um, so it's a very hostile, very angry kind of image. Um, so again, we sense the anger of the speaker, the anger of the father towards westernised culture and how it's kind of changed um, people's behaviour in Nigeria. One of the other images we see in the first stanza is this idea of ice block cold eyes. 
mean, the image of a block of ice is very hard and cold and unfriendly. So it kind of goes back to the bitter tone in the poem, the bitterness that the speaker feels about how people are now behaving. And of course, the coldness in that image also suggests the the kind of the hostility and the um, alienation that he feels in the relationships he has with other people. We also have the image of search behind my shadow, this idea that when he turns and leaves these people, they're kind of watching him from behind his back. It's a very sinister, uh, very predatory kind of image, as if people are kind of analysing him as he walks away, staring at his shadow. And that verb search kind of creates that sense that these people watching him are analysing and probing him for weakness. It's a very kind of aggressive image. Let's take a look at stanza two. Again, we have repeated use of the pronoun they. We keep having this all the way through the poem, this idea of they as... Um, almost the enemy in the poem, this kind of group of people who've changed their behaviour or the Westerners who are changing everyone's behaviour in Nigeria. It's a very impersonal pronoun. We never get anyone's names. We never get any specific groups of people. It's really, really quite um, vague. But it's been done deliberately to create this sense of us versus them. We also have continued use of past tense. Again, they used to shake hands with their hearts. This sense of looking back to the past nostalgically, this sense that people in the past behaved in a more friendly way, and now, of course, they don't, that the warmth's over and this kind of fakery has been exposed. Stanza two also kind of reinforces this kind of sad tone in the poem. If you have a look at the end of the line, they used to shake hands with their hearts, we see the use of it's a colon. And this introduces and emphasises the clause that follows but that's gone, son. And that line creates a sense of loss and sadness, this nostalgia for the past, and in some ways a kind of a hopeless tone because the sense that it can't come back, it's final. Again, we have continued use of imagery in this stanza, this idea that people shake hands without hearts, the image of people shaking hands but in a very cold, unfriendly way. And this kind of goes back to the idea that the father in the poem feels that people's behaviour now is insincere and fake. It lacks the genuine sense of warmth that he was used to in the Nigeria of his past. Stanza two um, ends with a really interesting final couple of lines. We get this um, phrase, while their left hands search my empty pockets. It's an interesting image because it suggests this idea that the final two lines in the stanza are really interesting. We have the image, while their left hands search my empty pockets. And that creates this kind of sense that the father is talking to either a Westerner or talking to a Nigerian who's become more Westernized. And as the father shakes hands with this person, they are going for his pockets with their left hand, trying to steal from him. So we get this sense of um, the Nigerian people being exploited, having things stolen from them by the greedy Westerners or by corrupt Nigerians who've become more Westernized. Now, if we read these last couple of lines um, in a more symbolic sense, we might even be able to argue that this idea of searching empty pockets really is an image of the kind of the Westerners who've come into the country searching, or in this case, stealing from the people, kind of going through their pockets, um, the pockets being a symbol for the land and its resources. Um, in that sense, the adjective empty might be a reference to the poverty of the Nigerian people themselves. So even though this group of people are really poor, the Westerners coming in are looking to exploit them, steal from them and, and take what they can. And again, we get that sense of bitterness about the situation. But by using a really personal, really kind of intimate image of essentially being mugged by the person you're shaking hands with, it makes us feel much more personal, much more invasive and much more hostile. Let's have a look at stanza three. Okay, well, we have again the repeated use of the pronoun they. I've, I think I've already commented enough on that. What's really interesting is that this stanza opens with this line, feel at home and come again. So we have the father, the narrator, or the speaker in the poem, imitating the voice of the others, this they he keeps referring to. And he's clearly mocking them, being sarcastic and trying to draw out the fact that what they say isn't true. It's not sincere. They say feel at home and come again, but they don't mean it. And of course, we get that here in the short line, when I come again and feel. We have this really short line and lots of enjambment. Enjambment, remember, is when a sentence runs over more than one line, um, otherwise referred to as a run on line. This sentence here suggests that kind of longing for sincere emotion, you know, come again and feel. 
Yeah, the last word on that line is feel. So it really emphasises this kind of desire to go back to an authentic Nigerian identity that is emotional, that feels, that's sincere and has all those things. Um, so we get again the sense of exasperation um, that the father feels, this desperate desire for people to be sincere and, and honest with each other. We have a use of rhyme. At home once, twice, there will be no thrice. So twice and thrice rhyme together. Um, thrice just means three, three times. Um, so it's being humorous and sarcastic at the same time. He's saying that, you know, once or twice he's been and visited these people, but the third time he goes around, they pretend not to be in or they don't let him into the home because when they say come again, they don't really mean it. They don't want anything to do with him. So he's kind of bitter and angry at this kind of um, insincere um, behavior. We have the image of closed doors. Um, I'm not sure how we're meant to read this line. I mean, the closed door obviously represents closure and finality in the relationship. It represents the insincerity and the fakery of the kind of the westernized people um, who invite him to visit but really don't want him to visit at all. But it could also be symbolic. Um, this idea of doors might represent opportunities. So doors being shut might represent this um, sense that Nigerian people are finding opportunities have been closed to them um, because of Westerns coming into the country. OK, let's have a look at stanza four. An interesting idea that runs through the poem is this um, idea of learning um, as a repeated kind of theme. And here we have the father talking about things that he's learned, this idea that he's learned to be insincere, he's learned to be fake in his behaviour towards others. And this comes across in the imagery in this particular stanza. We have the verb wear, the idea of wearing a face as if it's clothing, it's superficial behaviour rather than a real physical part of yourself. And he uses the imagery of faces like dresses. Again, it's a simile. Faces like dresses, this idea that you can change your identity just as easily as changing your clothing. And we have these different noun phrases for the different dresses, the different faces, if you like, that he talks about wearing. We have home face for his behaviour at home. You know, whether that means his behaviour as a father or as a husband, it's not very clear. But this sense that um, those are roles that we perform like an actor. We have office face for how he behaves at work, street face for how he behaves in public, host face for when he's having people round to his own home, and cocktail face presumably for his behaviour when he visits other people. But this whole thing is very bitter, very angry, this idea that these different faces uh, aren't really his authentic identity, aren't really him, they're just versions of him, performances that he puts on, when really deep down he just wants to be the one authentic person, his real self. And we get this verb conforming. Conforming just means to kind of fit in and belong. Um, and this idea that in all these different faces he wears, he has to have this fixed grin on his face, um, looking like he's having a good time, just so he can fit in with everyone around him. And he feels angry that these people are just wanting to conform. He feels angry and bitter that no one seems to speak up and do something about the changes in the culture around them. And that comes through in the final image um, in this stanza, this fixed portrait smile. It's not clear if he means portrait uh, as a noun or an adjective, um, but either way, we still get this image of a rigid, fake kind of smile, which is lacking warmth. We've all been there posing for a photograph and the person taking the picture is taking way too long and you're just standing there with a smile on your face. And the longer you hold it, the more and more uh, rigid it becomes, the more and more fake it becomes and difficult to hold. So this idea of you know, smiling here is really insincere kind of goes back to this idea of people smiling with their teeth, this fake smiling, this fake um, showing of, of happiness when really people are quite upset deep down. Let's have a look at stanza five. Again, we have repeated use of the verb learn, this uh, kind of going back to the theme of learning that runs through the poem, um, because the father has learned to be more like the Westerners and other Western influenced Nigerians, and he feels bitter about having transformed in that way. We have repeated um, lines which kind of come back from earlier on in the poem. Um, this imagery of laughing with your teeth, shaking your hands without your heart. We've seen those earlier in the poem. So in some ways they're rephrased lines, almost like a refrain. Um, a refrain is simply a repeated line in a poem. And it just emphasises that he's become more like the Westerners. And he's angry at himself for becoming so insincere and fake, almost becoming a liar. And he's longing deep down to return to his authentic, true behaviour, his true identity, because ultimately he wants to have that sense of integrity and feel good about himself again. Let's have a look at stanza six. We have the nostalgic tone running through this verse, this idea of longing to be um, 
authentic and true but really what that means is returning to the Nigeria that the father remembers from when he was a young man this longing to return to the past I want to be what I used to be um, before Nigeria became more westernized before it changed its culture and tradition and its values we get this wonderful use of the word muting mute means to silence something um, there's no such word as muting to my knowledge so we have a, a word being created here um, and it's been used perhaps as a verb, perhaps as an adjective, to describe all these different behaviours that silence his authentic voice, that silence his ability to speak um, as a true Nigerian man, as a kind of authentic identity. We get a use of contrast in, in the poem as well. We have the father who feels fake and insincere and feels like he's changed. And we have the innocence of the son. Um, we get this line, when I was like you. So the contrast there. And it also creates a change in tone because there's a sense now for hope in the future. The idea that the child, the son, might represent a possibility of returning to a better um, past in the future. It's a bit of a confusing idea, isn't it? So the child, although he represents the new generation, he also represents um, this possibility that Nigeria might regain or retake its authentic um, culture again. And that comes in again, of course, in this idea of relearning. This um, verb suggests the idea of the possibility of recreating something, relearning and returning to an authentic past. We have the imagery um, in the final line of a snake bearing its fangs. So this simile, obviously very hostile, um, suggests that the father is angry at himself because he's been um, taking on this kind of Western culture. And in some ways, it's made him really, really hostile as a person. This idea of bearing fangs is a very violent, very aggressive image. But of course, snakes also carry with them that kind of idea of poison and venom. So this kind of sense that perhaps he's been poisoned by the Western influences and corrupted in some way. Let's have a look at stanza seven. Okay, so the final um, stanza in the poem, and first thing to notice it, it's particularly short compared to the others. And that's because this final stanza suggests a really big shift in tone. We have the repeated use of the imperative. Remember, imperatives are those bossy verbs, show me. Because the adult speaker, the father in the poem, wants to learn from the son how to become a better person. And it's a really interesting reversal of that typical relationship. Rather than the adult being the teacher and the child being the learner, it's the other way around. So the child can teach the adult something about how to behave. We have this really interesting uh, final couple of lines. Um, on some level, it suggests this idea of nostalgia. Um, I used to laugh and smile. You know, I used, he's referring back to the past again. This idea that Nigeria in the past and his own behaviour in the past was somehow better than how it is in the Nigeria today. He's hoping his son can in some way help to reclaim the past and bring it back uh, and take Nigeria back to how he remembers it being in the past. But it's not clear if this is really um, a hopeful end to the poem or whether there's a sense that the adult persona who's speaking is imposing his romantic memory of, of Nigeria onto his son. The final line of the poem is really unclear. It's very ambivalent. Um, and it's ambivalent because we have the use of the fairy tale phrase again, once upon a time. And it's ambivalent because it suggests a couple of possible ways of reading it. Um, a positive interpretation um, would be that the final line, once upon a time, um, is using that fairy tale phrase again because of this idea of innocence, this idea that Nigeria can return to more innocent and authentic sense of its own identity. It can go back to how it used to be in the past and it can do it through the innocence of Nigeria's children. And in this case, the innocence of the son. You know, the son can in some way help to reclaim a Nigerian identity and make Nigeria better in the future. The other way of looking at it, slightly more negatively, um, is reading that line in a more ironic sense that the speaking persona in the poem knows deep down that he's being nostalgic and naive. You know, once upon a time is something we associate with children's stories. So it could be that the speaker knows he's being naive and in some ways quite childish. He's longing for a past that perhaps never really truly existed outside of his imagination and his memory. And maybe the Nigeria that he remembers was never really there at all. Um, so his hope that his son can kind of take Nigeria um, back to how it used to be might be an impossibility. 
Um, it's not clear how we're meant to read those two lines, um, whether we're meant to read it as nostalgia turning into hope, or perhaps something slightly more ironic and negative. You could argue either way. Once Upon a Time links together really nicely with several poems in the poetry anthology. You could link it to Telephone Conversation by Wallace the Inca if you're looking at the clash of cultures and values. In Telephone Conversation, you have an African man talking to a white landlady trying to rent um, a place to live and they kind of clash and don't get along. Uh, you could link um, the poem using the theme of parent-child relationships to something like Piano by D.H. Lawrence or even If by Rudyard Kipling. In fact, uh, this poem links really well with If because in Kipling's poem, you have a father telling the son to follow his own example so that he can become a trustworthy, dependable man. Whereas in Once Upon a Time, you have a father saying the opposite. Don't be like me. And in fact, let me learn from your example how to be a more trustworthy, dependable person. So it's a nice contrast. On the theme of advice and guidance, you could more broadly link it to something like Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night by Dylan Thomas. Uh, Thomas's poem is all about how to avoid regret, um, whereas, of course, Once Upon a Time, another contrast, it's more about living with the consequences of regret. Either way, there are a number of poems that link really nicely to Once Upon a Time, and it's a great one for use in the exam. As usual, if you found this video helpful for your revision or just for your general curiosity, then please click on the like and subscribe button and tell your classmates about this revision resource. Bye for now.